From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ralph Steedler, Johnny. Dollar liability. Oh, hiya, Ralph. What's on your mind? Poetry, you Philistine. Hmm? The bard's immortal words. Which words? Full fathom five thy father lies. Of his bones are corals made. And those... Those are pearls that were his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> What's the case, Ralph? Robbery? A pearl necklace? Ah, life insurance. $75,000 worth of bones down on the bottom of the deep blue sea. Or so they say. So who say? The insured's wife. The insured's best friend. Oh, they're quite positive about it. But you're not, is that it? Johnny, if I'm going to be stuck for 75 Gs, at least I ought to get the straight dope, shouldn't I? All right, I'll get it for you. Give me the who and where. It happened in Miami Beach. Check with the DA's office there. The insured was a man named William Markey. And the beneficiary? His wife, poor wretch. Oh, you're biased, Ralph. Sure, I'm paying alimony. So look it over, Johnny, and keep in touch. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Delta Liability, Hartford, Connecticut... The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Fathom 5 matter. Item 1, $143.40. Transportation, tips, and incidentals, Hartford to Miami. Purpose of assignment, aside from a chance to get a look at the sun, to check into the death of one William Markey, or to find out if there was a death, and how it happened, and where was the body, and if not, why not, and if so, how? Or rather, to determine... Well, anyway, the deputy investigator from the DA's office, a man named Barney Wilson, was at least as confused as I was. And he'd had a two-day head start. Now, we're going on the assumption, of course, that the man is dead. But legally, you understand, the fact hasn't yet been established. Meaning exactly what, Mr. Wilson? Well, it's pretty strong evidence, but no corpus delicti. Not so far, anyway. Maybe you'd better start at the beginning. And that would be where, Mr. Donner? How much do you know about the case? Well, uh, very little. Mm -hmm. The dead man, if he is dead, was named William Markey. He was uh, 46 years old, yeah. owner of a consulting engineering firm in New York. Mm -hmm. He'd been married to his present wife for three years. Her age is 30, and she's the beneficiary of his insurance. And, I might add, a charming and lovely young woman. They've been on here for about a month. And three days ago, Markey was killed, or allegedly killed, in an accident. That's right. Drowned, as I understand it, when a fishing launch sank a mile or two offshore. And then... Well, you can take it from there, Mr. Wilson. Now, your responsibility in the case is primarily to the insurance company. Is that right, Mr. Donner? Entirely, not primarily. Why, what do you mean? And it would be to the company's advantage if Markey's death were not legally established, huh? <laughs> they wouldn't have to pay the claim, if that's what you mean. Then it's reasonable to suppose, since the whole case is... Uh pretty vague at present that your efforts will be devoted to creating doubts as to whether Markey is really dead. Mr. Wilson, I think it's reasonable to suppose that I can't very well answer your questions without knowing exactly what has happened. Uh -huh. well, all right, then. Briefly, this is it. Apparently, Markey came down here to bid on a construction job, a manufacturing plant. We well, didn't get the job, but he stayed on, he and his wife and the young fellow that was with him. What young fellow? Name of Danny Haynes. He worked for Markey, a draftsman, an engineer. Evidently a personal friend of the Markey's. Oh. The three of them took a house down the beach south and spent all their time together, nightclubbing, one thing and another. I see. Anyhow, well, three days ago, Markey and young Haynes went out fishing together, hired a charter boat, a small cabin cruiser named the Fathom Five, and headed south along the coast, working the offshore banks. Whose idea was the trip? Markey's, according to young Haynes... In fact, all the rest of the story is according to Haynes. Nobody else saw what happened. And what did happen? Well, Haynes says they anchored off the reef and both of them fished from the dinghy for a while. Then Markey decided he'd go back to the cruiser and fix some breakfast. Mm -hmm. Haynes put him aboard and took the dinghy out alone. He says he fished along the reef for about 30 minutes before he looked back and saw the cruiser was afire. It was nearly a mile away, according to his story, and by the time he got back... 
boat was a pillar of flame. He didn't see any sign of Marky? No, he says not. He couldn't get aboard because of the flames, and uh, a few minutes later, the cruiser sank. Mm -hmm. No one else saw it? There were no other boats around? No, it was early morning, and there weren't many others out. It had rained during the night, and there was a fairly heavy fog. They're only a mile and a half or so offshore, so Haynes rode in with a dinghy and reported it. Mm-hmm. Tell me, what was the depth of the ocean where the cruiser sank? Oh, it was only about 50 feet. I've got a salvage company working now to raise it. Get a diver down? Yes, but he didn't find out much. He couldn't get inside the hold. That's about the size of it, huh? Mm-hmm, it is. Until they get that cruiser raised so we can take a look at it. And, of course, it may not tell us a thing. Yeah. What about the currents along the reef where that boat went down? Oh, they're pretty bad. Strong and erratic. A body could be carried through the reefs and on out to sea and never be found. Well, I was uh, thinking more of the possibility of a good swimmer getting into shore. You said they were anchored only a mile and a half out. Yes, well, it's possible, but not very probable. He'd have been seen by Haynes or somebody else. There was a heavy fog, wasn't there? Mm Mm-hmm, fairly heavy. And, of course, Haynes could be lying. Maybe he did see him. I said it was possible. But that's not the line I'm planning to take, Mr. Dollar. So I got it. They'll bring that hull to the surface sometime tomorrow. Now, maybe we'll have some evidence then. Or maybe Marky's body will turn up in the next 48 hours. And if not? Then, Mr. Dollar, I will petition the probate court to declare him legally dead. I suppose you've got some reason for all this, Rush. Yes, I want the fact of death established in order to file a murder charge. Danny Haynes? Who else? It's the old, old story, isn't it? Two men go out and only one comes back. Unwitnessed accident. Nothing new about it. No, no. And it's never been an easy one to prove. Well, it'll be a lot tougher a year from now if you people put up a fight and force the decision up to the Superior Court. Suppose Haynes himself fights it. I wish he'd try. It'd be the next thing to an admission of guilt. Oh, Mrs. Markey, she has legal status in the case. She could do it, but she won't. Yeah, you're probably right. She wouldn't be likely to throw away $75,000. Well, I can't tell you what we'll do yet, Mr. Wilson. I'll have to look around first, talk to the people involved, get my feet on the ground. Mm-hmm. Fine. Well, you just do that. Here, I'll give you the addresses. Oh, good. Mrs. Markey is still at the beach house. Young Haynes has moved into a hotel near there. All right, thanks. Say... How did the three of them get along during the month they've been here? Like peas in a pod, from all appearances. Of uh, course, what was going on behind the scenes might have been another story. <laughs> it usually is. I think that's where we'll find the motive. Not that Mrs. Markey encouraged Haynes at all. She's a fine woman. I know, and she's beautiful. And this is the South. How's that? So long, Mr. Wilson. I'll keep in touch. <laughs> Expense account item two, $3.35. Telegram to Hartford requesting an investigation of the Markey firm's financial status both currently and over the past three years. And a similar check of Markey's personal financial status. Item three, $4.10. Taxi to the Pompano Beach Hotel to talk with the DA's prime suspect, Danny Haynes. Look, Mr. Dollar, I've been over the whole thing with the police a half a dozen times. I'd still like to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. They've got the whole story, all I know about it. They had a stenographer to take it down. Why don't you go to them with your questions? Well, maybe I got different questions. I told them everything I know about Look, it. Look, Danny, you don't have to talk to me, but if you're smart, you will. Why so? Because the police already have their minds made up. Or at least Barney Wilson has. Sure. He's out to prove I killed Mr. Markey. Well, look, my mind isn't made up yet, so you can't lose anything by talking to me. Unless, of course, you did kill him. It happened exactly the way I told them. All right, what do you want to know? How long did you work for Markey? Two years. Did you get along with him all right? Sure. It was a good job. No complaints. You got to be pretty close personal friends, I understand. Well, I used to go to their apartment in New York once or twice a week for dinner, drinks. And then the three of you came down here together on a vacation. It wasn't a vacation. Mr. Markey came down to bid on a job. Did he need you along for that? Well, he thought there might be some sketches or plans to draw up. And were there? Well, no. As it turned out, they weren't necessary. Hmm. Funny, Marky wouldn't know that ahead of time, being an engineer. Well, actually, it was sort of Edna's suggestion of Mrs. Markey, I mean. I see. Yeah, now I see. Now, look, don't get the idea there's been anything between us. She's been swell to me. She's... 
Well, she's just wonderful, that's all. All right, all right. So the three of you came down on business, and within a few days, the job contract was awarded to another firm, but you still stayed on for three more weeks. That was Marky's idea. I don't know why exactly. I know he'd counted a lot on getting that job, but I was getting a free vacation. Why should I argue? So all of you just relaxed and lived it up, huh? Yeah, that's about it. Mr. Markey, too? No apparent worries on his mind? Well, he was moody sometimes. Went off by himself. But that wasn't too unusual. He was like that quite a lot. He and his wife seem to be getting along, all right? Sure. As far as I noticed, why? Well, let's talk about that accident for a minute, Danny. Whose idea was it to go on the fishing trip? Mr. Markey's. He woke me up at five in the morning, said he'd already phoned and hired the boat. The Phantom Five? Yeah, the same one we'd had a couple of times before. Mm -hmm. Well, I wasn't much for it. It was misting out with a heavy fog, but he was real hot on the idea, and I couldn't very well argue he was the boss. Was Mrs. Markey up when you left? No, but she knew we were going. She'd packed a lunch. I guess they'd talked about it the night before. All right, you took the boat out then and followed the reef south, and what happened? Well, we anchored as close as we could get to the reef and went out in the dinghy for about an hour. No luck at all. Then Mr. Markey decided he'd go back on board and fix something to eat. Uh I let him off and then rowed back along the reef. I figured as long as I'd had to come, I might as well try for a strike or two at least. And a while after that, I looked back and saw the cruiser was on fire. Was it still foggy then? Yeah, about the same. I could just see the glow. I couldn't even be sure what it was until I got close. I tried to get on board, but the flames were too high. I kept yelling, but there was nobody around. And you didn't see or hear any sign of Markey? No, I guess he was already dead. Then, not more than five minutes later, the cruiser sank. Yeah. Danny, do you have any theory as to what caused the fire? Well, it was a hot plate on board. A gasoline pressure rig. It was an old one in pretty bad shape. We'd talked about it before. I think it may have leaked into the bulkheads in the bilge. And when Mr. Markey went to light it to fix breakfast, the whole boat just went up in flames. I see. Tell me something, Danny. Do you think Markey could have committed Suicide? Suicide? Why? For what reason? Oh, maybe losing that contract. You said it was pretty important to him. Or maybe he thought he was losing his wife. What do you mean? Well, maybe he misinterpreted your friendship with her, Danny. You're crazy. You're in love with her, aren't you? That's my business. I told you there was nothing between us. All right, all right. But didn't Marky know that? Look, you're the same age she is, and he was 15 years older. A man like that might get to wondering... Knock it off, Dollar. Nobody's private life is going to be dragged into this. You better stop and think, Danny... Well, you've still got time. A defendant in a murder trial doesn't have any private life. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a lady weeps... A lover curses, and a strange, grim relic is brought up from the sea. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. (laughs) 